Wait, remember Monsuno? It's another one of those cartoons that also has a real-world card game component to it. However, it was one that got started a good bit later than the others out there, when there was a massive push for them in the early to mid-2000s. Premiering on the Nicktoons channel in February of 2012, Monsuno was put together through toy companies, trading card companies, and of course, Japanese animation studios to recreate some of the magic that happened a decade before with all of the other similar properties out there. Today, we're going to take a look at Monsuno and see if the series was able to capture its own vibe separate from what's come before it, what the show, along with the physical side of products, were all about, and what happened to it. Welcome back to the 25 Days of Fringe Miss, where there's going to be brand new- Wait, 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 wait. Uh-uh. Ah. Double Fringe Miss. Aw, you only thought you were gonna get 25 videos this year? Look at you. You look silly. But I'm here to fix that because I'm going to give you not only 25 videos, but I'm giving you 50 videos. I have two channels. That's two Fringe Misses. Each day there'll be a brand new video on both channels for 25 days. I haven't slept in months. Enjoy the content. Or don't. Getting into Monsuno, it was something that I was aware of when it originally was coming out, and I even ended up checking out some of the cards that were released for that aspect of the property, but it was never a show I really paid that much attention to, if at all, when it was coming out. For the show itself, the first season of Monsuno is known as Monsuno World Master, and it follows a group of kids, Chase, Bran, and Jinja, who are all searching for Chase's father who created what Monsuno are, kind of. This material that gets encapsulated through crystal came to our planet through meteors during the time of the dinosaurs, and in modern day, Chase's father's work bred the combination of creatures with the powerful essence, and thus we have these Monsuno. They're kind of like Pokemon, and also kind of like Bakugan, and even released like Beyblade. It's a big combination of things, honestly, but I do appreciate the show going out of its way with the lore to try and establish its own thing. I mean, imagine tuning into episode one and the first thing you see is the world getting destroyed. Yeah. I think I'm gonna continue watching this. Thank you very much. All of that happens in under two minutes of the first episode. Obviously, that was just a special dream sequence that Chase was having, but what a hook, honestly. I wanna know more about why that happened. Monsuno is coming up next. On Nicktoons. Things get explained and get going through Chase visiting his father's lab as the plot of what happened to his father and what is going on with Monsuno unfold. Chase's father was working for an organization called STORM, which cleverly stands for Strategic and Tactical Operatives for Recovery of Monsuno, as he wanted the use of this harnessed power to be used for good, but of course the organization had other plans, wanting to use these creatures and their powers as weapons. So Chase's dad tries to hide the rest of the research in Monsuno, giving his son access to it all, leading the organization to now be at odds with Chase, but luckily his dad gave him his very own powerful Monsuno to control, Locke, this big polar bear with large blue crystal spikes protruding from his body, and from here, his adventure to deal with those seeking Monsuno for evil doings, along with unlocking the mysteries surrounding Monsunos and of course battling with them, has all just begun. And of course there had to be a battling component, right? It can't all be a cool plot, we gotta make sure there's some marketability here. To release them, they come in these capsules known as cores, that get chucked and spun around to release the Monsuno out, and that's why it reminds me a bit of Beyblade and a little bit of Bakugan, but it still looks pretty cool, and honestly, the whole show looks pretty cool. The animation here is absolutely gorgeous, and I do like the main characters. Our main group of controllers here, that's what they're called, you know, similar to trainers, battlers, brawlers, duelists, etc., are known as Cortec, and all of the different groups of controllers have some sort of name, and I love that. Chase has the right amount of main character energy, he's full of charisma, and has that heroic side to himself that makes him worth rooting for. Bren is a childhood friend of Chase and is the less heroic and more strategic one of the group, being smart but always wanting to prove that he is stronger than he comes off. Then there is Jinja, a really great third character for the group that is extremely strong-willed, who will never back down when things get tough, and honestly, she may be the best character in the entire show. As some time goes on, the group gets larger and we get characters like Baal, who is a more spiritual character that is more reserved thanks to most of his life being a monk. And lastly, there is Dax, a character that has gone through a rougher past but comes off very cocky and can be at odds with the group thanks to his attitude, as well as a lack of taking certain situations seriously and not being one to always follow the rules. Yeah, he's the bad boy of the group and we appreciate him for that. While these are the main characters of Cortec, there is a fun side character that ends up being an ally to the team that presents their own mystery named Dawnmaster. Thanks to his ways of being a thief, he lends himself and his skills to chase in the others when the situation calls for it 
and with the porcelain mask and full cloak outfit he wears, it just makes his character 10 times more interesting. Who are you, you masked man? The world may never know. This Double Fringe Miss is brought to you by Gamer Subs. Hi, this is just your reminder that if you really need to pick me up during the day and something that tastes great and is also not the worst thing in the world for you because there's literally nothing in it. There's nothing in it except for great flavor. There's less than a calorie per serving. There's no sugars. And if you use my code FRINGE, you get 10% off. This holiday season, treat yourself right with gamer subs. The first season of the show initially is just following along with the mystery of Chase trying to find his dad and our quartet group having to deal with their Monsuno and getting into some pretty intense battles with them along the way. Like these feel like large Titan battles at times that come off pretty vicious in comparison to other similar shows. There are a mix of villains in the show that can range from your standard grunt copy and paste type characters, but some others really stand out like the leader of Storm, Charlemagne, a no-nonsense woman who commands the screen when she appears, but then there are also characters like One-Eyed Jack, who is labeled as this liberator of Monsuno, having that seemingly good intention notion of wanting freedom for the Monsuno, but for some reason still having his own that are under his command. Meaning that they're not free. Like, I get that he may need to use the Monsuno to free the others, but you know, he really isn't doing what he's saying he wants. But nonetheless, he's a pretty cool character for the show. There is also Dr. Emmanuel Clips, or Dr. E. Clips, and I see what you did there. He should be more menacing or just more interesting than he is, as he's such a pivotal main antagonist of the show, but his character comes off less interesting in comparison. The next two seasons would expand further with the stakes reaching higher levels thanks to more groups getting in the mix that are against Cortec, with the Forge Resistance and the Hand of Destiny being at the forefront of it, but my favorite and frankly just the most interesting are the strike team assembled by Charlemagne that act as direct counters to Cortec, and they all have these really cool outfits. These are the best of the best, a group that has gone through the toughest training out there to to be able to try and take on Cortec. And I'm always a sucker when shows like this have some form of direct anti-characters that are like the main group, just evil or at odds, essentially pitting our main characters in battle against themselves in a way. And Dr. Eclipse is back in the form of Six, a younger clone of him that infiltrates Cortec for the ulterior motives of Dr. Eclipse. But I really like how the series evolves as it goes on. Rather than having these loose episodes that can be watched whenever, it really follows a story that continually flows episode to episode episode, building up the characters not just in our main group here, but with the bad guys as well. With the third season seeing a lot more introduced to it, with the Monsuno having more variations thanks to the manufacturing of Dino Monsuno, or seeing Alien Monsuno, or even having Hyper Monsuno. But I love that when true evil is presented, others at odds have to come together and realize what is at stake to find where their goals align. Monsuno is coming up next on Nicktoons. The plots here do get a bit muddied with complication, but in the end, the focus on core members from the beginning is what's key, dealing with the last threat, Droog, which leads to an explosive ending. Then with Dr. E. Clips captured in the end and giving us a tease of him working with a captured Charlemagne, the future looks bright for Cortec and the safety of the Monsuno. But the ending of the series doesn't feel fully concrete enough, not resolving everything and still being pretty open if there were to be a fourth season. Now aside from the show itself, it all really boils down to the outside market with the products, you know, the toys, the card game, all of that. That was the vision in mind the whole time, and if those aspects of it weren't catching on or becoming something massive, then the property as a whole, at least in the eyes of the creators, isn't worth it. While the cards are cool enough and the toys tried to capture something in between Bakugan and a mix of all the other things that were out there, it just never stuck out enough for a large community to get into. They made so many different products in conjunction with the series, trying to replicate the capsules that would spin and make sure that it was still tied into the TCG somewhat. Which, in a world filled with so many trading card games, Monsuno, while still having a player base and audience, couldn't get too far off the ground. It's a shame, honestly, as I think the show really had something fun going for it. It was well animated, the story was interesting, the battles were visually intense, and I feel that there was more than they wanted to create from where it left off. The biggest thing Monsuno had going for it were the designs of the Monsuno. They felt really well designed so that they stood out on their own from the other 
similar shows out there, and I can tell that I am looking at a Monsuno and not a Digimon, or a Yu-Gi-Oh creature, or a Pokemon. And it's not easy to find your own distinct look in a crowded space, but I think Monsuno was able to navigate that all pretty well. Maybe if this had happened at a different time, perhaps a handful of years earlier, there could have been more interest in the series, and maybe if it weren't for it going onto the Nicktoons channel, aka the Cartoon Graveyard in a lot of cases, we've talked about that in many other videos before, there could have been something that clicked here. For what it was, it was a decent show. As far as the card game, I never really got into it aside from having a few cards from the time it released, but I never continued investing my attention towards it. I would love to know your opinions on the show though. Were you a fan of Monsuno at some point? Did you give the card game a try at least? Let me know your experiences with the property in the comments below. I've been Jordan Fringe, thanks so much for watching, like and subscribe, later!